Hello and welcome to the first episode of How To Guild Wars 2 with Tales of Tyria. There are a lot of misconceptions out there about how the Guild Wars 2 economy works. So today, we're going to explain everything from gems to buy orders. Let's dive right in. We'll start by providing an example to show what your experience using the Guild Wars 2 trading post will be like. Let's say our friend Thraken has just finished crafting a frosty mace of demon slaying. He'll walk over to the auction house and have two choices. Does he want some money for it right now, or does he want to wait and get some more money for it later? To get an idea of really what's going on, let's go behind the scenes. This is the kind of information you might be presented with. What you see here is the marketplace information for a single item in EVE Online. EVE is clearly a big influence on how the Guild Wars 2 marketplace works. Let's take a look at our own example though. You can see that there are a few other people also selling the Frosty Mace of Demon Slaying, and each of them is selling at a different price. This is typical for other auction house systems like those in World of Warcraft. What you may not understand is the buy orders section listed below. This is a list of people who are willing to purchase a Frosty Mace of Demon Slaying at a specific price. Our friend Thraken could list his mace for sale, just like those other people have done. If he wants to, he can undercut the lowest price to ensure that his mace is the first one to sell. He might decide, however, that he will take a risk and list his mace higher than the current lowest price. Maybe he's been following market trends and he knows that anything under 5 gold is much too low a value for this mace. So he might set his price at 5 gold 14 silver. This means when someone comes to buy a frosty mace of demon slaying, they will buy the one that Lucas is selling. After Lucas sells his mace, Thraken's price will be the lowest on the market and his will sell next. He will essentially have given himself an extra 16 silver. You might notice that in both of these cases, Thraken is putting his item into the trading post for a promise of coin later on. This is usually where things end with World of Warcraft style auction houses. But in Guild Wars 2, Thraken has another option. He could instead sell his mace directly to one of the people who are listed under the buy order section. These people all have posted a price at which they are willing to buy a frosty mace of demon slaying. Thraken would obviously want to sell to the highest offer, which in this case is being offered by Reliant. Note that if Thraken chooses to sell directly to Reliant, he'll be getting significantly less coin than if he listed the item and waited for the gold. Thraken decides he doesn't need the money right this second, so he lists the item and undercuts everyone else at 4 gold, 98 silver. Now let's look at the opposite example. Let's say our friend War Truck wants to buy the same mace. He has the same kind of decision to make as Thraken did. Does he want to buy the mace right now for 4 gold and 98 silver from Thraken? Or does he want to list a buy price and wait for somebody to fill the order? War Truck just happens to be on his way to fight in a dungeon, so he wants that item right now. He decides to purchase directly from Thraken. He might pay a little bit more than if he had posted a buy order, but he will get the item right now instead of having to wait. Now that we've covered the trading post, let's take a look at the various currencies in the game and how they interact. Let's start by looking at the most basic elements of any MMO economy. Coin and bind on equip items. These are the two things that most players trade in most MMOs, and Guild Wars 2 is no different. In Guild Wars 2, we've got gold, silver, and copper representing the coin, and the bind on equip items are the kinds of things that drop from mobs and players when you kill them in the game. For those of you unfamiliar with the term bind on equip, what that means is that this is a piece of equipment that can be traded to other players freely up until somebody puts it on their character for the first time. Once they actually equip the item, it becomes bound to that character and can no longer be sold or traded to other player characters. It can only be destroyed by salvaging for materials or selling to an NPC vendor for a little bit of gold. We'll see why that's important in just a minute. First, let's examine where these two currencies are generated within the game. World versus world, dynamic events and personal story, and in dungeons. Every time you kill an enemy player, every time you kill an enemy mob, there's a chance they drop coin and items. Every time you complete a dynamic event, even those in world versus world, such as capturing a keep, you earn gold. As any economist would tell you, any currency that is constantly being created will also have to be destroyed or the value of the currency plummets and we have runaway inflation. So there has to be something in the game that takes gold out of the game system. That's where gold sinks come in. Gold sinks 
are things like travel costs, repair costs, or NPC vendors that will sell you something in exchange for gold, permanently taking that gold out of the system. Now there is one other thing that takes gold out of the economic system. You can spend gold to get influence. Influence is a special currency earned when representing a specific guild in the game while you're playing. Everything that you do in the game while wearing that guild's tabard earns influence for the guild. Guild leaders can then spend that influence to get various bonuses within the game. An extra bank tab for your guild, or maybe a special weaponsmith that will craft weapons with your guild's logo on it, or temporary bonuses like extra magic find, or buffs whenever your guild is defending the keep that they claimed in World vs. World. Now that we've come this far, let's talk about how this flowchart is set up. Circles represent things that are generating a currency. A rectangle with rounded edges is a currency in and of itself. A square is a place where currencies go to die, some kind of destruction mechanism that takes the currency out of the system. Double black arrows represent trade back and forth between two different types of currencies. Currency generation is represented by a green arrow, currency destruction is represented by red, and currency exchange, when you turn one currency into another, is a green and red arrow. That about covers it for the gold system in the game. Let's continue the item system. As you can see here, items can be destroyed by salvaging them and turn them into crafting materials. Crafting materials are actually a source of new items in and of themselves, and you can get crafting materials by gathering them from the world. You can also get them by buying them from vendors in specific situations, including a brand new currency, Karma. Karma is a special currency that is generated by playing dynamic events, by completing objectives in World vs. World, and by participating in yours and your friends' personal stories. Now what makes Karma different from Coin is that you cannot trade Karma to other players. You can only trade it to specific Karma NPC vendors in the game. Now the majority of those vendors will provide you with crafting materials, but you will also find some that will give you special bind on pickup items. These are items that are untradeable the instant that you get them, unlike the bind on equip items, which are available to trade first, and then once somebody equips them, that's when they stop becoming tradable. Bind on pickup items essentially become soul bound to you the instant that you pay karma for them. These bind on pickup items are useful for differentiating people who have accomplished something from those who haven't. For example, if you go through a dungeon, the Ascalonian Catacombs, for example, and you complete it and destroy the end boss, and it's a very difficult, you go through the explorable modes and you defeat all that stuff, what you get in the game is another form of currency called tokens. You can then redeem special pieces of gear for these tokens. The tokens themselves are untradeable, and the gear that you get is untradeable untradeable. That means the only way to wear that special gear is to go through the dungeon and make it all the way to the end. This ensures that people who wear that gear are able to show off and boast, haha, I've made it through that particular difficult content and to prove it, I'm wearing this gear that only people who have made it through that dungeon can wear. And so that's what makes bind on pickup items really neat in the terms of the game. They're a way to show off an accomplishment. Now, bind on pickup items can also be acquired by spending glory, which is another form of currency that is specifically awarded to players for participating and doing well in structured PvP. Now, the last currency we're going to talk about has gotten a lot more press than any of these other currencies, and that's the gem system. Now, gems can be acquired directly in exchange for cash which you can then spend those gems on special items from the gem store. Things like uh, XP boost, magic find boost, uh, character slots, or maybe bank slots, special bags, other kinds of vanity items like costumes. Now, these gems can also be exchanged directly for coins, which means that the gems interact with the rest of the economy. Now, let's stop this for a second and focus in on specifically the pieces of the economy the gems can interact with, because that's the point of contention that the kerfuffle is all about. One of the first things that you'll notice is that cash can get you gems, gems can get you gold, gold can buy you influence, and influence can give your guild some bonuses. So a lot of people are asking the question, doesn't this just mean that this is pay to win? I can pay cash, get 
gems, gems convert to gold, gold converts to influence, and influence converts to awesome guild bonuses that make our guild better in world versus world. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. Yes, it does technically give you the chance to pay to get these guild bonuses. But it's important to understand that every single interaction here is very inefficient. So that you would have to spend a lot of money to get a lot of gems to convert into a lot of gold, which then can, gets converted at a very inefficient rate to influence, which then can get you some bonuses for your guild. The other part of the question here is that the guild bonuses in question are not remarkably powerful and they're all temporary. So if somebody wanted to pay to win and make like a guild be really awesome, for example, they'd have to pay a huge ton of money all the time to keep that guild in that place. Even were they able to afford such an expense, it seems to me that the only benefits they would get that would really help them in combat against another guild would specifically revolve around the single keep or castle or tower that they have controlled in World vs. World. All of the other bonuses that are granted are things like maybe better magic find or faster karma generation or faster XP boost for the, everybody in the guild. The only things of material value that affect the guild in a combat in World vs. World are specifically in the region around the keep that they control. So if one guild was to do this, you could just go around it and not have to deal with it. And we also know that World vs. World was never designed to be balanced. You really don't have to play World vs. World if you don't want to. It's designed to be epic, and the, the one of the design goals is not to have it be completely balanced. Because if you tried to make it completely balanced, you would take away from the epic nature of it. So, the other thing to notice about this is that structured PvP is nowhere near the gold system. It's completely separate. It has nothing to do with the gold system. In fact, anything that you can gain uh, from the gold system can't even really be used in structured PvP. Structured PvP has its own set of items which cannot be used or mingled with PvE gear per se. And so there's literally no pay to win when it comes to the structured PvP or the competitive PvP. And that about wraps it up. I hope you guys have learned something from this and I hope that I've been able to put some fears to rest by pointing out all of these currencies and how they interact with each other. If you did enjoy this, I highly recommend you check out our other video series. It's called Tales of Tyria. It's an audio podcast where myself and my co-host discuss various aspects of Guild Wars 2 on a weekly basis. We discuss the various news of the week as well as usually have some kind of a roundtable discussion on a very in-depth topic such as competitive PvP or you know, the mindset that it takes to win at games or what kind of end game you expect to see in, in Guild Wars 2 or even just MMOs in general, like economy systems is what we're going to be talking about this week to go along with this video and the whole gem kerfuffle. So if you definitely uh, are interested in any of those topics, if you want something to listen to while you're in the car, on the way to work, at the gym, check out talesoftyria.com. Everybody, this has been Bridger. Have a good one.